everybody so today we're going to talk about hemodynamics and shock and everything that you kind of need to know and the mindset that I typically have when I deal with a patient when it comes to shock and really understanding the volume status of a patient okay so let's start off with this say I give you a patient who's coming in hypotensive feeling dizzy feeling really weak and you check the patient's blood pressure and the blood pressure is low by definition what defines Shock. Non-responsive to fluid requiring pressures. Non-responsive to fluid requiring pressures. But if somebody's blood pressure is low, sure, if there's not responding to fluid requiring pressure, that's a good definition, sure. Hemodynamic instability. So what is your blood pressure? What defines shock in Less the sense of blood pressure numbers? Less than 90 systolic? Okay. Yes. So number one, you can say is a systolic blood pressure less than 90. That's one very definition of shock. Okay, great. What else? MAP less than 65. Good. MAP less than 65 is also shock. Okay, what else? Uh, reflex tachycardia? Not really. Because you can have a reflex tachycardia if somebody was on a drug like hydralazine, which is going to cause vasodilation and as a result tachycardia, right? Organ dysfunction? Yes, so if somebody's got end organ damage, okay? Meaning, if somebody's blood pressure, if somebody's blood pressure and your systolic blood pressure is really not less than 90, say it's high, but the patient is typically hypertensive, but it is low from his baseline, but technically doesn't fall under the definition of shock, but you have evidence of end organ damage. What are the classic end organ damages we look for? Which one? Altered mental status. Okay, altered mental status because you have decreased blood flow to the brain, sure. Okay, the big one is creatinine elevation, right? Elevated creatinine causing an acute kidney injury. That's your classic to look for when somebody is having end organ damage. What else? Troponin. Cardiologists love this one, right? Elevated troponin, then they love to come and say, hey, this is demand ischemia. Always the demand ischemia word actually comes in. But what they're implying is, when your heart, when there's low blood flow through the coronary vessels, you are having less blood flow to the cardiac myocardium and as a result you're going to end up having elevated troponin right so elevated troponin is an important sign too what else lactic acid. yes lactic acidosis is another important one now why do you get lactic acidosis and so end of the day metabolism no, what's it called? So cellular metabolism Anaerob Anaerob is not oxygenated, you're saying it's anaerobic glycolysis. Mm -hmm. Anytime any cell needs to produce energy, you need to go through aerobic glycolysis and then go through your TCA cycle and electron transport chain to produce ATP. But if you don't have oxygen or you don't have enough blood pressure and therefore the cell is not requiring or getting enough oxygen, then you will do anaerobic glycolysis. If you do anaerobic glycolysis, you will produce lactic acid. That's why every single patient you see who's in shock, you'll see lactic acid is actually elevated. So those are your end organ damages. What is number four? A systolic blood pressure drop by more than 40 millimeters of mercury is another definition for shock. My most favorite definition of shock is what? It is cellular level hypoxia. If every cell in your body does not get oxygen, for me, that is shock because your cell is not getting oxygen. So really what you're talking about, cellular level hypoxia. If you think this explains shock the best, your treatment to fix this will solve all problems. So that's the important reason I like to think of cellular level hypoxia, meaning a cell in your body is not getting oxygen. So do whatever it takes to ensure that that cell gets their oxygen it needs. So these are your classic definitions of shock. Fine. So if somebody is coming in with shock, what is the first important thing that you want to do? Patient is obviously in shock and blood pressure is low. What do you want to do? Fluids. Fluids. So really, you said fluid, you said pressors. Which is the right answer? What if somebody has got CH of exacerbation and they are completely fluid overloaded but they are also in shock? See, this is when you go into this Confusion state. It's very important when you see somebody and they're hypotensive for you to determine if this patient is in a specific type of shock. 
So it's very important for you to clinically define what the type of shock is. It's not that we always blindly want to give everybody fluids. Fluid is not always going to be your answer, right? But acutely, if somebody's blood pressure is dropping, it's like 40 over 20. Yes, it seems like you want to give fluids. But really, if you don't understand what the main pathology is, the fluid is not going to solve the problem. Yes, it's going to bring your blood pressure up and by some time, but it might not solve your problem. So what are the types of shock we have? So let's put it like this. This is the heart right here. Okay. And this is your left ventricle and it's going to pump blood out your aorta. And this is your inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. This is your pulmonary artery, which is supplying blood to your lungs and your pulmonary veins are going to drain it to your left atrium. So I'm just going to put left atrium and left ventricle here. Okay, so let's talk about the types of shock. What are the most important types of shock? Distributive. Distributive. So I'm going to say distributive. I'm going to put it here. Distributive shock. What are the types of distributive shock we know of? Septic. Septic shock. When you think about distributive shock, it is more of a vasodilatory shock. So septic shock is an important one. Electric shock. Yes. Next is anaphylactic shock. What else? Neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is essentially when you have injury to a spinal level and therefore you're losing your sympathetic tone and therefore you're going to have vasodilatory shock. Sure. What else? Something more common that you see. Oh, for distributive shock. What else can cause distributive type of shock? Something you see more commonly. Burn. Burns is also going to cause, as opposed to more distributive, I would consider burns to be more hypovolemic. Because when you have your skin, it's one of the biggest organs in the body. Its job is to not let you lose so much fluid. If you have burns, you lose a lot of fluid and it would result more in a hypovolemic shock. What about pancreatitis? What about pancreatitis? Yes, pancreatitis can also cause a distributive type of shock. Pancreatitis patients will develop a hyperinflammatory state just like in septic shock. Okay, so distributive shock is one. And think of distributive shock as mostly predominantly vasodilation. And your vessels are going to get stretched out and everything's going to leak out. Everything's on a third space and intravascularly you're going to become very dry. Okay, what else? Okay, hypovolemic shock. Okay. Hypovolemic shock essentially means you are dehydrated, maybe you had too much diarrhea, maybe you've been not drinking enough water, maybe you lost a lot of blood. No matter you lost blood or fluid, end the result is hypovolemia. So hypovolemic shock. Okay, what else? Okay. Cardiogenic shock. Now, cardiogenic shock is when a patient has either an acute MI or somebody's got heart failure that your heart is not pumping blood out adequately and therefore your cardiac output is low, also your blood pressure is going to drop. What else? Obstructive. obstructive shock. What is an obstructive shock? Yeah. Okay, obstructive shock. Important one is PE. What else? Cardiac tamponade, sure. Cardiac tamponade, yes, and lastly is going to be pneumothorax, okay? Your classic ones are going to be more tension pneumothorax, but a regular pneumothorax can also cause an obstructive shock if it becomes large enough. Okay, so you see when you see a patient with shock, it could be a bunch of different things. Most of the time, the ones we typically like to learn about is septic shock, pancreatitis we see a lot, so we need to know about that one, anaphylactic shock not so much, neurogenic shock not so much. Cardiogenic shock, yes. Hypovolemic shock, yes. Obstructive shock such as PE, cardiac tamponade, pneumothorax, yes. Bottom line, most patients who are in shock, it makes sense that they are most likely going to get fluid. Say the one that we classically like to see is septic shock or a pancreatitis patient with a distributive shock. Most of the time, the right answer when it comes to somebody in shock is going to be, in fact, fluids. What is one time you could think about where you don't want to give fluids, but rather you go to pressors first? Yes, if somebody's got heart failure, congestive heart failure, and they're in shock because they're in cardiogenic shock, meaning your heart is not pumping hard enough, therefore your cardiac output is low, you look at them, they've got bilateral pulmonary effusions, congestion everywhere, they got JVD, they got edema all the way, 
And the patient is in shock, sure. But the patient is fluid overloaded. So you giving them more fluid is only going to work the heart even more. So for a patient like that, you'd rather go with a presser first as opposed to give volume. So this blind idea of giving fluids to every single person in shock is wrong. That's bottom line. Assess volume status of a patient by assessing the volume status of a patient. So let's think about how I assess the volume status of a patient the moment I walk into the room and I'm going to walk you through what I will do in the computer after that. The moment I go into the room, what am I going to look at to assess true volume status of a patient? A good physical exam to see if the patient's got edema, I look at your skin turner. Most patients that you see who are volume depleted, they look really dry. The skin is all shriveled up, there's no edema whatsoever. So a good skin exam in your leg as well as your arms is important. Typically you ask the patient, hey, are you thirsty? They'll most of the time be thirsty. That thirst is an important sign as well. Okay, what else can I look for? Look at the tongue. The tongue is going to look really dry. Urine output. Okay, urine output. So if a patient is just coming and they're saying, hey, yeah, I'm not peeing as much as I was before. That tells me a good sign saying, hey, my urine output is low. Why? Because I am volume depleted. So my body is trying to preserve all that volume. Okay, what else? From a physical exam. Very good. Tachycardia becomes very relevant because if somebody is hypotensive because their volume depleted, what happens? When your blood pressure drops, what's going to happen? Remember, you have two important receptors which are called baroreceptors. You got your carotid sinus and your aortic arch. Carotid sinus communicates with your brainstem. So the way it goes, this is your aortic arch and this is your carotid sinus and this is your brainstem. These are stretch receptors, meaning they will only stimulate when they are stretched. So when somebody is hypotensive, that means you're not going to stretch. Nine communication from the carotid is via ninth cranial nerve and this is via the tenth cranial nerve. Okay, aortic arch is ten, carotid sinus is nine. And carotid sinus is your main baroreceptor. So if the somebody is hypotensive, this is not getting stretched. So your brainstem goes, well, I'm hypotensive. What am I going to do? I'm going to do sympathetic stimulation. When you stimulate sympathetic stimulation, Remember your blood vessel has three receptors, alpha 1, beta 2 and M3. Which is the only receptor here that is actually innovative? Only alpha 1 is innovative. So when you stimulate alpha 1, it is GS coupled. As a result, when you stimulate it, it is going to raise cyclic AMP levels, which essentially is going to cause vasoconstriction. So that's why when you become hypotensive, you get vasoconstriction as a reflex. But at the same time, the sympathetic stimulation is also going to stimulate what? It's going to stimulate beta 1 receptors of the heart and that's going to lead to an increased heart rate. So an increased heart rate to me is a sign that the patient is volume depleted. That's why I'm having increased heart rate. Makes perfect sense. Beta 2 and M3 are not innovated, but when you do stimulate them, what do they cause? Vasodilation. Beta 2 causes vasodilation. M3 is also going to cause vasodilation and that becomes very important when I go into pressor. So I want you to remember that. Alpha 1, beta 2, M3. In your blood vessel, alpha 1 you stimulate, you're going to get vasoconstriction. Beta 2, M3, vasodilation. Got it? Okay. So heart rate being elevated is a very important sign for me to say yes, the patient is most likely volume depleted. Great. What else? What about blood pressure? If I just look at the monitor and look at the blood pressure, say the blood pressure is 120s but this is a patient who typically runs hypertensive in the 180s range the patient having a blood pressure low compared to what his normal level is tells me yes it could be the patient is hypertensive and therefore that's an important sign what else so blood pressure being low from your baseline is an important indication of hypovolemia what else what about the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure which is called no. no what is MAP? Pulse it's two-third diastolic blood pressure plus one-third systolic blood pressure. That's different. A pulse pressure is the difference between systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So if you look at pulse pressure, that is systolic blood pressure minus your diastolic blood pressure. What gives rise to systolic blood pressure? Heart. The heart. Very good. So your cardiac output is what's responsible for systolic blood pressure. Your 120, 130 number that you see on top is all through with the heart. What gives rice your diastolic blood pressure? Venous return. Not venous return because 
Venus return is preload. Preload is going to contribute to cardiac output. So it's not. Vascular Systemic vascular resistance, your peripheral vascular resistance. Your iota and your peripheral blood vessels that supply the vascular tone that it has, that peripheral vascular resistance is what's going to give you diastolic blood pressure. So this is called total peripheral resistance. So imagine a patient who's in shock. Let's just walk through this normal process that happens. This is how you want to think about it in the sense of physics. Because once you understand it, you understand it well. So if somebody is hypotensive, you're going to get sympathetic stimulation. And the sympathetic stimulation is going to do what? It's going to cause increased contractility to your heart. If you increase contractility to your heart, would you increase cardiac output? Uh, in, in shock? Yes. Say if somebody is in shock, you're like, okay, blood pressure is low. So I'm going to get my beta receptors to fire. Beta receptors are going to fire sympathetic. Sympathetic is going to stimulate your heart. Stimulate your beta 1. So you're going to get an increased heart rate, increased inotropy, cardiac output should go up. Cardiac output goes up. What happened to systolic blood pressure? Goes up. It has to go up. Great. At the same time, the same sympathetic is also going to go stimulate your RAS system because you have decreased blood flow. And even having less blood flow to the kidney is going to stimulate your RAS system. If you activate your RAS system, Aldosterone is going to reabsorb sodium and water. So you're going to increase preload and again bring more volume in which is again going to contribute to nature, increase systolic blood pressure. And then what's going to happen to your diastolic blood pressure? Increase because you're going to have resistance and it's going to increase. But imagine if a patient had septic shock. When you think of septic shock, is it the infection that's causing the problem normally? It's your body's response to the infection. So the infection comes and infects you, your macrophages are going to eat the bacteria and release all the cytokines and interleukins, which is going to cause a profound vasodilation. So when it causes a profound vasodilation, what's going to happen to diastolic blood pressure? It's going to drop. So it's going to drop and as a result, you're going to see a wide pulse pressure. So it depends on the type of shock, but typically having a wide pulse pressure, it most of the time is going to be more indicative of a distributive type of shock. Maybe a pancreatitis patient or a septic shock patient or even a patient who's hypovolemic even though you're getting a sympathetic surge and you're going to stimulate your peripheral receptors which is going to cause vasoconstriction what happens if you squeeze an empty tank then you produce a blood pressure you can squeeze your blood vessel all you want but if you don't have enough volume because you're dehydrated or you lost blood is your blood pressure going to go up no so your diastolic blood pressure will go down if you look at total peripheral resistance, what is that equal to? Viscosity times length divided by radius to the power of 4. It's your total peripheral resistance calculation of a blood vessel. So when your radius goes down because you're squeezing it, your TPR should go up. But when you squeeze a tank that's empty, it's not going to produce that blood pressure. So it makes sense why when you have a hypovolemic patient or a shock patient because of distributive, you would expect a diastolic blood pressure to be low. Another thing, I said viscosity. Viscosity is important to maintain blood pressure. So if you have less blood, it's less viscous too. So as a result, that is another important factor to play a role. And so having a wide pulse pressure gives me some important insights to tell me the patient is volume depleted. What else? What else can you see on the patient itself? Anything else on the patient? What if the patient got an elevated JVD? The patient got an elevated JVD tells me more CHF. So understanding volume status apart from a good physical exam, Heart rate being high, blood pressure being low, a wide pulse pressure tells me yes, the patient is most likely hypovolemic. So we finish the physical exam. Say we open the patient's chart. 